Hi, I'm here with Danielle Yates, and she's the manager of marketing recruitment for the English Language Fellow Program. And she's here to speak with us about opportunities abroad through the English Language Fellow Program. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So I just wanted to ask a couple of questions so we can get the, the news out to some of our, our candidates, our, our American um, and U.S. citizen candidates uh, about some of the opportunities that this program holds. So if you could give us an overview of what is the L English Language Fellow Program? Sure, thanks Jennifer. Um, since 1969, the Fellow Program has sent thousands of experienced U.S. TESOL professionals abroad on 10-month paid teaching fellowships. Fellows assist U.S. embassies around the world with enhancing English language teaching capacity and increasing mutual understanding through cultural exchange. Great. Um, that sounds very interesting. <laughs> and what is the connection to the U.S. Department of State? The fellow program is funded by the Office of English Language Programs within the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Fellows support the U.S. Department of State's public diplomacy mission abroad and are counted among the more than 50,000 individuals participating in exchange programs each year. And it's, since it's through the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, um, why, how is this considered a cultural program? Great question. Well, living abroad, fellows are representatives and cultural ambassadors of the United States, whether they are teaching students about American history or holidays, sharing teaching lessons and resources with colleagues, or even just shopping in the local um, market, they foster a greater understanding of American culture and values. And in exchange, they also participate in and discover the culture and customs of their host country. And I think we can see that a lot in some of these pictures and it also gives a little uh, view of what fellows do on assignment and uh, maybe you could go into a little more information about what they do. Great. Um, so all of our fellow projects are 10 month um, full time teaching positions that do typically follow the academic calendar year starting in roughly September and ending around June. Um, on assignments, uh, our fellows teach a variety of courses, working with undergraduate or graduate students, um, conduct teacher training for pre-service or in-service teachers, develop resources, and coordinate cultural activities. Um, on top of their teaching duties, they also can create and implement secondary projects, which could include hosting or presenting um, at professional conferences, uh, organizing cultural events, uh, supporting community outreach initiatives, and many other activities that are organized by the U.S. Embassy. Great. It, it's just such a great way to get a lot of experience and, and even to build up a resume and, and come back from that. You have so many new skills added to, to your repertoire after that. So, um, and, and as I'm still looking at these slides, I see Mongolia here and I've seen Laos and Vietnam, Paraguay. Um, where, where do fellows go? Great question. Um, our fellows engage in valuable work where they're typically placed in a university or a binational center, a teacher training college, or another academic institution. Uh, right now, we're in more than 80 countries around the world. So all of our projects are developed by our network of U.S. embassies around the globe, working in collaboration with local host institutions. Uh, typically, the assignments are located in more developing countries or rural areas that um, would like to expand access to English um, to build communication skills uh, needed to fully participate in a global economy and society. Great. And you mentioned earlier about how um, some of the assignments or um, tasks that the fellows do can consist of teacher training, developing resources. Um, what are some of the other benefits from participating um, like within professional development categories? Great question. Yeah, this is definitely um, considered a professional development program um, for participants. Um, it provides a platform for um, fellows to enhance their TESOL careers by gaining deeper experience with teacher training, uh, resource development, and also testing and assessment, which are big topics in the TESOL field right now. Um, our fellows not only share their expertise and experience as well as their interests, they also develop new skills um, by teaching in different contexts and gaining unique international experience. Great, sign me up. <laughs> uh, 
who, who would be eligible to apply for something like this? Great question. So this is definitely a competitive and challenging program. So I'll put that out there first and foremost. Um, to qualify, unfortunately, you must be a U.S. citizen um, with a graduate level degree that is preferably in TESOL or a field that is related to English language teaching. Uh, you must also possess a minimum of two years of full-time uh, TESOL classroom teaching experience. And those um, applicants that we consider most competitive will not only meet sort of those basic eligibility requirements, they will also have some experience with teacher training, uh, resource development, testing and assessment, um, English for specific purposes or English for academic purposes are definitely helpful areas to make sure to include in your application. Um, in addition, we have found that um, fellows are most successful when they possess personal qualities such as flexibility, resourcefulness, and cultural adaptability. Um, and typically for those that are interested in applying, you know, our fellows on average have about four to eight years um, of full-time teaching experience. Okay. Um, what would, um, or how, how do candidates apply to this? Great question. So uh, right now we are accepting applications for the 2017-2018 cycle, which would begin in the fall of 2017. Um, we only accept applications online, um, and that can be submitted through our website, which is elprograms.org. Um, with your application, we do require also two reference contacts. Um, those are, are contacts that you will enter into the system, and then we will email them um, with a link to complete the form, so we do not take letters of recommendation. Um, we do on our website have complete application instructions. Um, uh, at elprograms.org. And one thing I should mention is it is a pretty detailed and rigorous application. Um, so it will take you more than a few hours to complete. But the great news is that because it's done all online, the system will actually save your information. So you do not have to do it all in one sitting. You can start and come back um, at any time. And you mentioned the, um, the letters of recommendation. Do you have any um, suggestions of who those would be good coming from? That's a great question, yeah. Um, we do require two. One of those must be a current or your most recent supervisor, and that really needs to be someone who has observed you in the classroom. We're going to ask them questions about your judgment, your work ethic, your classroom management, um, your strengths and your weaknesses, so it should really be someone who's who knows you pretty well and has observed you on you know, possibly more than one occasion. Um, for the, your second reference, that could be a colleague, um, a co-teacher, uh, it could be another uh, former supervisor, um, or it could also be a grad um, school professor as well. Okay, and you said the deadline to apply is now for, for wow. next year's, for 2017 cycle. Um, so that's typically on in November, early December, or? Yeah, so every year um, the application opens in September, usually it's that first week of September, um, and that application is opening for the next year. So when it opens in September of 2017, it means that you are applying for applications that would be accepted for the um, fall 18-19 school term. So right now we are in the 17-18 cycle, um, and that means that um, applications, the priority deadline was November 30th. However, that is just a priority deadline, it is not an absolute deadline. We are still accepting applications and we will continue to accept applications until all of our positions for 17, 18 are full. Um, basically what the priority deadline means is it guarantees that if you meet that deadline, um, you will be through the review process in time to join our applicant pool, um, which we start matching two projects in January. So if you're interested in applying for 17, 18, you have missed that priority deadline, but that does not um, mean that you still cannot apply. In fact, we would encourage you to apply as soon as possible for that cycle. If you are interested in 1819 or years after that, um, just remember that the application will open in September and that priority deadline is always on November 30th. And it just gives you the best possible chance of being considered for all available projects. Okay, would, would um, someone need to apply each year? So say they were not accepted for one year, would they need to resubmit their application for the following year? That's a great question, and that is correct. Yes, because it is a government program, we do run on an annual cycle. So you would need to reapply to the program for every single year in which you wish to be considered. But the great thing is, is that because the application is online, we will save your information. So if you apply this year and for any reason it just doesn't work out, all of that information will remain in the system. We do encourage you, though, to go back 
to revisit what you've entered, to add in new experiences, and just make sure that no changes to the application have been made. Because we do tend to update questions if there's confusion or um, you know to help make it more clear for you um, and how to and what we're looking for. So definitely check that first. Um, update all the areas that need new information, and then you can resubmit. Okay. Um, and say I submitted my application and I'm moving forward. What is the review and selection process? So this is actually a three-step process and it takes quite a bit of time. Uh, so once you've hit and submit, um, we've received your application through the system and we've received those two reference questionnaires, um, we will start our um, review process. It is multi-step, it is pretty rigorous, and we're looking to identify um, your eligibility, your qualifications, and also your suitability for a program like this. Um, so this could include an interview, which would be conducted via Skype. Um, and if you are fortunate to successfully pass through all the stages of this review process, you will then be placed into what we call our applicant pool. And this just uh, is the applicant pool that we use to consider candidates for available projects. Being placed in that pool, unfortunately, does not guarantee that you will be matched to or selected for an assignment. And that's simply just because um, we actually have more candidates in the pool than we do available projects. Um, when we're ready to begin the matching phase in January, um, we pull directly from our applicant pool and we're looking to match candidates to projects based on a um, fit between their qualifications and skills and the project. Um, and the way it works is that um, the projects are actually developed by our embassies working with a local host institution. So they are meant to address very specific local needs. And ultimately for you, that means that all of our projects end up being a little bit different in terms of what they're looking for, what skills might be used, what experiences might be helpful. Um, so you are applying to the program for worldwide consideration, but we're really looking to find the right project for you. Okay, so that means that I would not necessarily be able to select or choose a specific country, region, or, or project. Correct. So we definitely take um, preferences and we keep them in mind. Um, unfortunately, we just can't make a guarantee that we will have a project in your preferred area or for your preferred sort of skill set. Um, so I would encourage you all to be as open and as flexible as possible um, when submitting your application. There is a place in the application where you can talk about um, any preferences that you might have, whether it be regionally um, or more locally, um, as well as the types of projects that you would be uh, sort of most interested in or that you think you would thrive in, you know, whether it be more teacher training focus, more teaching focus, curriculum development, or some other topics. Um, and we definitely take those into consideration. But again, we're looking to make that match to a project um, that requires your skill set. And so that doesn't mean um, that all of the projects that you'll see on our map or on our website are going to be projects that um, you would be a good fit for. Great. Okay, so let's imagine that I've gone through this review and selection process, I've been selected, and now I'm wondering what's the compensation for this? Great question, <laughs> and this is I think another added bonus of our program. So in addition to that personal and professional growth that we've talked a little bit about, um, we do offer a very comprehensive and um, I think generous benefits package. So every fellow receives a $30,000 stipend, which is theirs to keep, and is deposited directly into their bank account. And they should not have to actually touch that stipend throughout the course of their fellowship. And that is because we also provide a living allowance. And this living allowance will cover all of your costs of housing, food, local transportation, and utilities while in host country. And then we will cover your round trip international travel from your home base uh, to your new home. Uh, and we will provide you with a supplemental health benefits plan. It is not an insurance plan, so more than likely you will still need your own insurance, but our plan will definitely cover things like emergencies and some prescriptions um, from things that uh, you know, come from your uh, time in a different country. And then additionally, um, you will receive a few different other allowances for things like activities to help set up your classroom, provide much needed supplies or materials, uh, to help you ship uh, anything that you might need from your home base to your new host country. And then um, there is a potential for an additional dependence allowance for anyone who might be traveling with a spouse, domestic partner, child, parent, or sibling um, who will be living with them for at least five months um, while in country. Uh, you would receive an additional $500 per month that they are with you. 
Oh, great. So even it doesn't limit, you don't have to necessarily just be um, a single person just out of college. This, this is, seems like it's a little more flexible with allowing maybe family or m members to come along as well. So it opens up a few more potentials or possibilities for people. Absolutely. Okay. In fact, we have a video we just posted on our website of our fellow who is currently serving in Ukraine, and this is actually his second year there. Um, and he is traveling with his wife and two young sons um, who are grade school age. And they were very fortunate in their situation at work so that the wife is taking a year leave from um, her job and is actually homeschooling the two young children. And he talks a little bit in the video about how they get out and do things together and explore their you know, new community and are learning the language together and are doing some really cool cultural activities. Nice. And um, that, I guess, uh, it makes me wonder, you, you said uh, it's his second year, so it, there is a potential for more than one year? That's a great question, yes. All of our fellowships are designed to be a 10-month project, um, and they are created to work at a specific host institution. A lot of times, though, those host institutions um, have sort of multi-year uh, or long-term goals that a fellow project might help fulfill. So um, I'd say probably about a quarter of the time uh, that university uh, works with the um, embassy to actually um, extend the project. Um, typically, it's the project that is extended, not the fellow. But if the project is extended, um, the host institution and the embassy can offer um, to renew um, that particular fellow if they'd like. Um, and that fellow can only serve up to two years um, in, in the same position. Um, however, though, for fellows who don't get renewed, and because it only is about 25% of projects, not everyone will get that second year, um, we do allow fellows to reapply to the program. Um, now, I should caution, though, because it is a um, cultural exchange program, we do want to encourage as many teachers as possible to have the opportunity to serve um, in this capacity. So we do give uh, priority to new teachers. Um, so anyone who has served in a fellow position within the last five years um, basically is only considered for projects that are available at the very end um, of the matching process that we've had a hard time filling, whether it's because the requirements are too high or um, we just haven't had a lot of interest in those specific areas or those activities. So that tends to only be, I'd say, maybe 5 to 10% of projects, and it's usually at the very end of the cycle. Um, after five years, though, those fellows are once again considered um, new participants, and so that becomes a great opportunity for them to come back to the program. Okay. Um, approximately how many applicants do you receive, uh, or applications do you receive each year? Yeah, great question. Um, on average, um, we're getting about 550 applications and we're expecting that to actually grow beyond 600 um, in this current cycle. Um, and we are only um, currently filling about 100 projects. So typically it's about a one in six chance. So um, definitely think about um, all of the different experiences that you've had, both as a teacher, but also as a professional. Um, I, I know that I mentioned ESP and EAP earlier. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of those types of projects, we tend to find people who have outside skills. Um, so if it's ESP for hospitality, it's someone who's studied the hospitality industry or worked in it. Um, ESP for business or for medicine, um, people who've worked in a business environment, who've taken some business classes, who've um, taught um, business English themselves tend to be uh, more attractive to those types of projects. So um, definitely try to include as much as you can about your teaching and TESOL related experience, but also you know think about what other experiences you possess, um, trainings that you've done that might make you maybe more attractive to some of these more uh, special projects. Right, definitely. Okay. Um, and then also going abroad or going to all these different countries, um, what if I don't speak the language there? That's a great question. Um, you know, we don't require any language other than English. Um, and because of that, we also do not provide any English or sorry, any language training. Um, the majority of our fellows actually take it upon themselves um, to find some opportunity to learn parts of um, the language. I'd say they've done it in many ways, whether informal or formal. Um, formal being, you know, some of them have felt um, on certain projects or in certain countries that the language was so important, they actually use one of their program activities allowances to take a few classes, whether through the embassy or through um, other local channels. But most of our fellows really just find that, um, you know, exchanging tutoring in English for tutoring in the local language with a colleague, a local teacher, a neighbor has actually been really efficient and effective. 
Um, the great news is that for your actual project, because you are working with an adult population, typically at a university, they do have some English language capacity and some training. Um, so really the, the, um, the language that you use in the classroom to communicate is English. And a lot of our fellows have actually said that they felt like when they have known the local language, it's actually been a bit of a disadvantage mm -hmm. uh, because then their students rely on using whatever the local language may be and are not um, as inspired or motivated to use their English language skills. So um, it really does help sort of build a little bit of empathy for you as an ESL teacher in the U.S., to understand what the experience is like to go abroad um, and be in a foreign country and not speak the local language. Right. And, and so it's kind of reassuring to know that there's going to be someone there or a few people within the context that will be able to support. Um, but how does the support work? Um, you know, once, once we're there, how, how what kind of contact do we have with, with you or with um, any support back in the U.S.? Great question, and the great news is, is that you actually have multiple layers of support when you're on assignment. So the first thing that happens before you leave is um, a member of my team um, here at Georgetown University who administers the program will get in touch with you to collect your information, to sign your agreement, and throughout the course of your fellowship, that particular person will be your point of contact for things like your expense reports, you know, if you have general questions, um, turning in your um, required reports in order to get some of your payments. So you'll definitely want to make sure that you stay in constant communication with them. In addition to that, um, you will come to DC um, in August, um, right before that you head out for your project for what's called the pre-departure orientation. Um, you'll get to meet many of the um, embassy staff, um, as well as the State Department staff that you'll be working with through the course of your fellowship during that week-long training. And that training is really more general to kind of um, help you understand the goals of the program and, and sort of how you um, uh, serve as a fellow and sort of represent um, our cultures and customs and our values. Uh, once you then get to um, your host country, you have what's called um, a regional security training. And um, you'll meet with the regional security officer. You'll meet with the people who live at the embassy that is nearest to you or, or potentially the consulate. And they'll actually go through more local training, so cultural context, staying safe, avoiding you know, health um, issues. Um, and then finally, once you get to your actual school or new local community, um, you'll have contacts there. So more than likely, you'll have a co-teacher. Um, and that simply is more of a professional development opportunity for them. Um, but they also tend to be your best source of that local cultural context. Um, and many of our fellows have gone on to use them as sort of the, their tutors that they work with. Um, so they will be your contact on site. They kind of help you navigate the different layers um, at your university. Uh, so they are kind of at the local level, then you've got your embassy um, who's at the next level, and they really help in case there's any kind of um, safety or security concerns, um, simply because we take safety and security so seriously, and as an American citizen, you are our top priority. Um, so you're definitely in communication with them. If any issues come up, whether it be about safety or security, or whether it be, gosh, I was I was supposed to only be working, you know, 40 hours at this university, but I'm working 60. Um, they would sort of step in and kind of help you navigate any situation like that as well. And then Georgetown is sort of a, a third layer just to make sure that, you know, we know how you're doing, um, how you're enjoying the program, and if you have any questions about your participation. Great. So it sounds like it's just such a great opportunity. And um, is there anything else that you would add to encourage those who are considering applying that maybe think, oh, is it the right move for me? Or um, do I have the or maybe the little confidence boost? Yeah, that's a good question. For them? I like that. Um, I would say no fool I've ever talked to has ever regretted this opportunity. Has They've never regretted taking advantage of this. They've never regretted going somewhere new and learning a culture or um, experiencing new things. So I just would really encourage you to be open to both this program, but the opportunities that it might bring to you. Um, I would just encourage you to apply as long as you meet the minimum eligibility, that two years of experience and that um, master's degree or higher. Um, go ahead and submit your application, whether you 
you know, think that you're competitive or not um, for the cycle that's, you know, closest to you, go ahead and apply because the worst that could happen is you maybe don't get it this year and you can apply um, again in the future. And many of our fellows have said they've applied one, two, three, times, even four times um, and before they were able to get um, a fellowship and they wouldn't have it any other way. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me today to just give a little bit of an overview and um, more information about the program. And thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>